Thank you very much. Today's a, a special day for Church of the Chimes, and this is an interesting kind of a service to me. It's, a, it's the kind of service that I think makes a lot of sense for a church family. You know, we, we can get very used to our patterns. We can get very used to how we do things. And when, when Don came to me and said, okay, we'd love to have some kind of a memorial for Ruth, we were at first talking about you know, maybe a Friday, maybe a Saturday when people could come. And, and then it occurred to us, you know, why don't, why don't we celebrate her on Sunday? And, you know, I appreciated his humility about it so much. He said, I don't want to get in the way of, you know, worshiping the Lord or focusing on the Lord. And I, I just thought that was such a kind thing to say. And yet, the life of a Christ follower, watching a person's life who is given to God, who pours themselves out in gratitude and in love for their brothers and sisters. That, that, that's what the Lord's all about. That's why he made the church, so that we can encourage one another, so that we can stimulate one another to love and good works. And that's what Ruth did. And the interesting thing about this is that several of you uh, probably knew Ruth, and several of you probably didn't know Ruth and never even met her. And yet, Church of the Chimes has greatly benefited from the seeds that she planted, from the way that she watered in her ministry, and for the legacy that she left. And so, when I prayed about this, and when, even when our team prayed about this this morning, the reality is, in, in remembering Ruth, we are honoring God. We are thanking Him for the gift of a woman who, who gave her heart to Him who loved her family and who loved her church family, and her life showed that. So to me, it's, it's, a, beautiful, um, it's a beautiful mix of honoring God for who he created Ruth to be and the effects that she had on all of us, whether we knew her or not, the legacy that she left, and also a time to just remember a dear sister, a wife, uh, a mother, a grandmother, and I think that's important for us to take time to do as a family and as a family of God. So I'm very thankful to be here, very thankful to be a part of this, very thankful Carl Overbeek is here today and, and Pastor Cork is here today, people who, who interacted with her in a pastoral way, knew her and loved her and saw the work that she did. And so I'm very excited to be a part of this. And I just, I just want you that even if you didn't know Ruth, I don't want this to be a service that passes you uh, without reflection. I don't want it to be a service that you miss. I, I, want, I want you to engage in it in a way to recognize that, hey, this is what it looks like for someone to finish well. This is what it looks like for someone to give their life and finish well. I'm going to say a prayer in just a moment, and after the prayer, we're going to sing uh, three hymns that were um, some of Ruth's all-time favorite hymns. And I just invite you to enjoy that, to join in it, both as a memorial for her, but also as an honor to God. Before we do that, let's just pray together. And one of our traditions here is just to, if you would, just extend your hands towards me, and I'll do it towards you. And this is agreement. Father, we, we bless your holy name, and we are grateful for all that you've done. We're grateful for Jesus Christ, your only son that you sent. And then, Father, there's so many other brothers and sisters in this family that you designed, that you created, that you gave to this community of believers. And we celebrate one of them today. And in so doing, we honor you for the gift you gave us in Ruth. Lord, let, let the words that are said today let the songs that are sung, let the, the prayers that are prayed today, let them all be uh, an offering, a heart offering to you from each one of us. Holy Spirit, may you be here. May you speak through us. 
May you guide us. May we get out of the way. And may we be able to recognize just your incredible generosity in every good and perfect gift that you've given us in this life. We celebrate you, Lord. In Jesus' name. I want to invite you to stand up as we sing these, these wonderful hymns. I absolutely love the hymns. And uh, we're doing it in a fashion that, um, that I remember growing up at Ballard Baptist Church in Seattle, Washington. And that is a voice, or actually several different voices. That's you and a piano and an organ. So I, want, I just want you to encourage, I want to encourage you to sing out with your hearts and with your voices these wonderful, wonderful hymns. We're going to start by singing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace.
you for a time such as this. Great is thy faithfulness. No matter what goes on around us, no matter the wackiness or just the strangeness that has been going on all around us for the last year and a half, God is faithful. God is good. He's a good father. And his faithfulness goes on and on and on forever. Great is thy faithfulness. Lift up your hearts, lift up your voices. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. I don't think I have to tell you what a thrill it is to be here today. We enjoyed 15 uh, precious years with you, and we're grateful. My wife Ruth Ann's here, our daughter Leanne, and her husband Mark. They shared a lot of these times here, too. We're very, very grateful indeed. I just want you to know that Pastor Lee said I had five minutes, and <laughs> you did. You said that to me. Yeah, you said that to me. And so you, you know only too well, you give a pastor five minutes, he's going to take, oh, an hour, that was cold. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of truth in that. And then, uh, Don, you've got to understand, you, you're asking an 81-year-old to remember back this part, all the details. So I did some facts checking with Norm Kreiser on this. So if it's not quite right, talk to Norm, not me. Okay? <laughs> 
honored to honor this year, really. And, you know, the place to start for me is, is Ruth's smile. Tells it all. You could, you could almost stop there. Tells just about everything. Lit up the room. Lit up every situation. I'll never forget that. And there was always a little giggle, laugh with it, too. It was always very, very precious. Ruth was always uh, very much up front in the background. And I'm sharing this as I saw her. It, it was her persona. She um, served and gave of herself and everything she did. Choir, you've already heard, Sunday school, women's ministry, committee work, or any other ministry that uh, needed support, Ruth was there when asked. And for me, her palm print of grace is on just about everything around here in life. One experience, Ruth Ann, and Ruth Ann and I sat down and talked about some of these. One of the experiences we talked about when we moved here, our furniture Furniture did not arrive in time for our house, and so we were improvising. And what did Ruth and Don do? They brought over a car table and chairs. So we at least had a place to sit and eat and enjoy things, and we're deeply grateful for that sensitivity and caring. On a recent newscast, the commentator, one of my very favorite, Troy Gowdy, said, and this was his refrain mentioned all, over and over again, if you want to be an influencer of people, be a teacher. He said that over and over again. Well, guess what? Ruth became a teacher, a first grade teacher. I had kindergarten. I had to fact check that one. First grade teacher. And rose to become master teacher, who influenced hundreds of precious kids, giving them the positive picture of their journey of education. What a precious thing. So easy to picture Ruth in the classroom enjoying, guiding, and influencing these children, these precious kids that God entrusted to her. I learned she also had a piano in that classroom that was part of her teaching tools and just another gift she had that she shared. For those of you that may not know, when Don and Ruth moved here, uh, Ruth became, uh, started her teaching career and Don went to Santa Clara University and earned his uh, law degree, which you practiced your entire career right here in San Jose, didn't you, Don? Yes. Then my wife told me this, this little tidbit that I loved. She said she and Ruth were talking about women's slacks one day. Now, now there's, there's a purpose to this. And, and the purpose was they were talking about how important it is to have pockets in your slacks. And I remember looking at Ruth and what do you mean? You, you can buy something that doesn't have pockets? Can you imagine that? Well, the point was being that as a teacher, you needed those pockets for a ton of reasons, and you can appreciate that. But... I would have never thought of that one, but it makes perfect sense when you think about it. I learned that Ruth, I didn't, I didn't really know this, although John my mirror, was choir director and children's director here for a number of years in this church. Again, music being one of her strong gifts, and all of you who love music know how much you can say about your life uh, through the gift of music, and she shared it. Now, this, this one may have to be facts checked. Uh, one unfortunate memory I have uh, is that Ruth... Uh, twisted her ankle. I thought it was here on the church grounds on a liquid amber pod. You know those annoying little pods? Was that here at the church, wasn't it, Don? Thank you. Oh, your dad's right. No, your dad's right on that. I hate to tell you that, but <laughs> regardless, that was just one of those freak accidents, and you want to say, go figure. I love this one. This is special. Ruth reflected perfectly her Midwest Protestant work ethic always on time, always giving her best. It's the most important, doing all things as unto the Lord. Of course, she was uh, much more than these brief words that I'm able to share. Wife, already said mother, grandmother, friend, leader, influence, encourager, just to mention a few. And when you try to paint a picture of a person's life in just a few minutes, it's hard, but Today, you'll get a chance to talk to Don and the family. I hope you, you fill in some more of the, the cracks here, things that you remember that are important to her. But as you know, uh, Ruth battled cancer for a number of years and a number of other issues and ultimately uh, succumbed to these issues as all of us will one way or another. But we can say of Ruth DeVries, and uh, where's, where's your music director here? You've got to learn to pronounce those Dutch names. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You have to work at that. It's a little, it's a little, it's a little crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not you have to work at it. You have to work at that. You just do what you do. We can all say of Ruth of Reese, what? Well done. Let's all say it together. Well done, good and faithful servant.
I might take advantage of this stool right here. Sitting there and walking up, I just noticed that window, that stained glass window behind me, and uh, that was done by, designed by a guy named Gene Fixie. And some of you may have known the Fixies. Very good friends of uh, our family and mainstays of this church for a long time, and that's kind of the theme of this eulogy slash obituary for my mom is that she made this place the centerpiece to her life. It was the centerpiece to all of our lives. My, and my mom was born in uh, 1940 in Iowa. I started attending this church in about 1968 or so. My folks settled here from northwest Iowa, as was mentioned by Pastor Overbeek, who stole a lot of my information, by the way, without checking with me. <laughs> uh, they came to this church in 1968 or so because it was a Dutch Reformed church, Reformed Church in America, and that was the tradition that they were raised in. And settle in here they did for over 50 years. Like I said, this place became the centerpiece of my mom's life and all of our lives. Thank you for setting aside some time today to honor my mom. And I can't tell you how appreciative my family and I are for this moment. Thanks to Pastor Lee, the staff, everybody for putting this together. Like I said, my mom was born in 1940 on a farm in unincorporated Sioux County, Iowa, about 35 miles south of the Minnesota border. In other words, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and um, that farm, however, was heaven to her. She had one older brother, Dave, 
And with her and her parents, they farmed that land of corn and beans and raised those pigs and cattle and chickens. She would take some eggs from the chicken coop every week and go to town and buy candy and pop. She also had many dogs. This is a funny thing. She also had many dogs through the years. Each one of them was named Pal. When one pal died, the next puppy would be named Pal. <laughs> and my mom said one time, we had a pal cemetery behind the barn. <laughs> Every morning before school, she would milk the cows, and all her little kittens would line up for a, a very well-aimed squirt. Northwest Iowa in the wintertime can be brutal, with temperatures easily 20 degrees below zero. And her dad, Hank, would wake up every morning at 4 a.m., excuse me, and go down to the basement and put coal or corn cobs in the stove just to make the house a little bit warmer. When his uh, children and wife got up in the morning before he went out to do chores. In other words, it was not Elma Den. <laughs> Even a little bit, huh, Dad? <laughs> Without indoor plumbing, and which my mom didn't have indoor plumbing on that farm until she turned 18. I asked her one time, well, how did you go? And with temperatures below freezing, I said, what, hap what happened, Mom, if you had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night? She said, well, you just didn't. <laughs> and I said, well, how did you stay warm? And she said, lots of blankets. You just had to sh shake off the frost when you woke up. And her home on the farm was a happy musical one. Hank, her dad, taught himself how to play the piano masterfully. I mean, not just like ding, 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 like all over the place. And he had this accordion squeeze box that he could just bring the roof down. So much so that neighboring farmers would ask him to play um, at their barn dances. And I think that's where my mom got her musical talents and her aptitude for that. And then there was the church, always the church. Boyden First Reformed Church. That's where Ruthie, that's what she went by in those days, was baptized and where she would later be married to my dad. It was in the town of Boyden, about 10 miles away, population 750 people. Yet despite that distance from the farm, Ruthie was there four to five times every week. She played the piano and other instruments sang solos and in the choir. She started Christmas pageants, went to Sunday school, youth group, and the whole week's worth of itinerary. She helped her mom with potlucks and socials. She grew up with that church being the centerpiece of her life. In 1958, my mom graduated from high school, and in 59, she married my dad after a year of attending Northwestern College, which is the Reformed Church College in Orange City, Iowa. After that, it was off to Iowa City, and that's where my dad finished his um, undergraduate studies at the University of Iowa. Go Hawkeyes. I don't know if the Hondorps are here, I can't see them, but Hawkeyes are 6-0. and oh. <laughs> After uh, University of Iowa, they, then they were off to Newport, Rhode Island, where my dad attended officer candidate school to become an enlisted officer in the United States Navy. And then upon graduating from OCS, uh, my dad was on a ship overseas and actually was in the Philippine Islands on the USS Paul Revere about the time I was born. My mom, was, uh, my mom and I were waiting for him to return. We were in Orange City, Iowa, and return he did. There was a picture in the slideshow that Melissa prepared showing my, mom, my dad. He, he got leave from the ship to come to my baptism in Orange City. After his sea tours were done, my dad was given the choice of, uh, where do you want to go, Don, for your shore duty? And he, his first choice was San Diego, California, where it was always sunny and warm. <laughs> <laughs> and after a few years there, they decided that Iowa didn't sound so good anymore with those cold winters. They didn't have to shovel snow in California, so they decided to stay here. They then came up north. Um, as Pastor Lee, or, or maybe as Pastor Overbeek indicated, and my dad um, enrolled at Santa Clara University Law School. My mom uh, went back to her undergraduate studies, but she wasn't able to finish in Iowa and got her undergrad degree at San Jose State. And not being content with just that, she got a master's degree in education from there as well. 
And also during this time, after they came up here, they found this incredible place called the Church of the Chimes. The Church of the Chimes. It wasn't this building. It was that old sanctuary over there. Some of you might remember that. I think I saw Jeff Bam. Did I see Jeff Bam? <laughs> I've known Jeff Bam since before he was born. <laughs> and, and his parents. I mean, that's how close we all were. That's who, that's who this family was. That's who this, this place was to all of us. As soon as we got here, of course, my mom got... Uh, Excuse me. My mom got very involved with the music program at the church right away, and it wasn't long before she was handling it all, including the choir, special music, Christmas and Easter programs, the Christmas Eve service, the quartets like the ones my dad was in, the journeymen and the four winds, I think. Is that right? The four winds? You name it. In a modern church today, she might have been called a music director or director of music, but back then she was just called a choir director. And that was plenty for her. That was just fine. When we moved into what would become our family home, one of my parents' first big purchases was a brand new piano. She played it every day. And many hours were spent around it working on new church music. Our house had become a happy and musical place too, with old country gospel hymns, choir pieces, Christian arrangements being played around the clock, each day, every day. After finishing her studies, my mom started teaching. And we're going to hear from Jan Thompson Krupp here in a little bit, um, who can tell you more about this than I can. But she went to Stonegate Elementary School in the east side of San Jose. And she taught first graders for 40 years, almost 40 years, in room C4. Not only were those little ones not able to read or write when she first got them, because they were five or six years old, many, many of them didn't speak English. She saw it as her calling to teach them. And her greatest joy came when, many years later, an adult graduate at Stanford, for example, would walk into that same classroom and say, Mrs. DeVries? And she would turn with a start to hear the person say, my name is Lisa Nguyen, and I'm now, I'm now the head of neurology at Stanford Medical Center. And, and you taught me how to read and write. That would bring her to tears, and it was her greatest joy. Her passion for the little ones, of course, took root at the Church of the Chimes at the same time, where she taught Sunday school, put together countless Christmas shows, Sunday school programs, Sunday morning, Sunday school sing-alongs, teaching the children old Christian favorites and Bible stories, vacation Bible school teacher every summer, and so, so much more. Pastor Overbeek alluded to. Today, maybe her title at the church might be Director of Early Childhood Education, but back then she was just a Sunday school teacher, and that too was just fine by her. But even all of that wasn't the heart and soul of the Church of the Chimes for my mom or for our family. All of that didn't make this place the centerpiece of our lives. If I had to choose a word, it would be the old Christian term, fellowship fellowship. I know that's kind of a cliche or one of those Christian words that we don't really think about that much, but it's so important. At least three to four times each week, we got together, we joined together as friends and people unified in our shared beliefs and what was important to us, whether it was me or my little brother at youth group or ski trip or church camp or my parents at choir practices, consistory meetings, building committee meetings, their adult groups called the Clippers and the Cutters, <laughs> potlucks, social times, Christian concerts. I can't even begin to list everything, but we were here on these grounds four to five times every week. It was the centerpiece to our life. And even more than that, every single family of friends we had on this earth were friends we became close to at this church. There were no others. My parents would socialize with their parents, going out to dinner, or symphony season tickets, or family vacations, or outings all over California. Their kids and I, like Pete Kreiser, who's here, <laughs> would jump off of tree swings into swimming holes in the summertime or go to the movies. We were all so close, and we still are to this day. When we got here in California, to California in 68, and came to the Church of the Chimes, we left our, all of our families behind in Iowa. Well. Guess what? We found others whose families were far away too. 
We soon formed a tribe and with it a lasting tradition. Every Thanksgiving and Easter, these expatriates would cling to each other and replicate what would have been their experience had they been home many states away with their real families. This happened every year without fail when I, until, from when I was very young until all of us were married with our own children. In short, we became our own family. Those adults were like uncles and aunts to me, and some of them are here today, which means so much. Their children were closer to me than my own blood cousins, all from Church of the Chimes. And my mother thrived in every minute, every aspect of that, every experience, memory, and photograph. It was the centerpiece to her life, that Christian fellowship. So in the end, Ruth Jacobs Mudvries from the farm in Boyd, Iowa, who didn't have indoor plumbing until she was 18, who had to shake off the frost from her blankets in the morning time. She went on to get a master's degree in education, was named teacher of the year, and traveled the world. From the beginning until the end, the church, this church, was the centerpiece of her life. From that center, everything else branched out, and she would not have lived her life any other way. Hi everyone, my name is Ellie DeVries, and I'm the granddaughter of Ruth DeVries. So I'm going to try to keep this short, but okay. my grandma is a woman that cannot be described in words. I find that attempting to do so is very difficult. She was strong, courageous, and warm. She was empathetic, quick-witted, and funny. My grandma was someone I've always looked up to and admired and aspired to be like. She, ha she taught me how to navigate life with a smile, love for Jesus, and an occasional trip to Nordstrom. <laughs> My grandma has read to me since I was born, beginning with children's books, and eventually she introduced me to a book called Jesus Calling. I knew she read this every day in her chair, but I had never known what it was about. Little did I know the impact that this book would make in my life. In early adulthood, I picked up this devotional again and eventually redevoted my life to Jesus Christ. I want to share with you today's devotional as I find that it relates to my grandma's heart. October 10. Trust me enough to let things happen without striving to predict or control them. Relax and refresh yourself in the light of my everlasting love. My love light never dims, yet you are often unaware of my radiant presence. When you project yourself into the future, rehearsing what you will do or say, you are seeking to be self-sufficient, to be adequate without my help. This is a subtle sin, so common that it usually slips by unnoticed. The alternative is to live fully in the present, depending on me each moment, rather than fearing your inadequacy Rejoice in my abundant supply. Train your mind to seek my help continually, even when you feel competent to handle something by yourself. Don't divide your life into things you can do by yourself and things that require my help. Instead, lear instead learn to rely on me in every situation. This discipline will enable you to enjoy life more and to face each day confidently. If I know one thing for certain, it's that my grandma trusted in the Lord with all of her heart. She was always at peace, with, at peace with where she was going and had even asked to go and be with her mom in heaven. I have such admiration for this woman as she was never afraid. Sorry. She had a faith I have never seen before. The last time I talked to my grandma, she was hardly responsive. I grabbed her hand, told her I loved her, not expecting any kind of response. She looked up to me, she looked up at me, smiled, and said, I love you more. And that is the essence of my grandma, nearing the end, smiling and speaking her heart. Before I end, I just want to share a verse that has allowed me to maintain my faith throughout the past year. 
Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And now it's my honor to introduce my grandma's best friend, Jan Thompson. Good morning. Um, well, I didn't expect to be standing here, but I'm happy to uh, tell you some things I knew about Ruth. Um, I was Ruth's friend for, for over 40 years, and I was her teaching partner for 20. My friend was sweet, kind, loving, talented, artistic, smart, musical, a great mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, and a faithful wife. But if you think her sweet voice and loving ways, that that was all she was, you would have missed her spine of steel. Oh, my friend could cry. She cried at the drop of a hat, but she was oh so strong. She battled cancer, cancer, cancer. She worked full time while raising wonderful sons and running a seemingly perfect household. She volunteered at church, as you all have heard, and much more. I began my journey with Ruth in 1980 at Stonegate School, teaching first grade in connecting classrooms with collapsible walls that allowed us to make our two classrooms into one. Each morning, I had the privilege of calling out, good morning, Smoofy, and in her sweet, voice, she would call back, good morning, dear heart. I definitely got the better end of that greeting. I think Smoofy was a nickname that Jamie gave her, and I called her that forever. So in 1980, Ruth and I began teaching together after she returned from her first battle of cancer. It was January, and she walked over to me with a lesson plan book, and she asked me, what page are you on in reading? And I told her, she gave me a quizzical look, and she asked, why weren't we further along? Well, I had no answer. You see, it was my first year teaching first grade, and I had no idea what the pacing of the curriculum should be or should have been. Well, I was about to be schooled by the master. So Ruth taught first grade, only first grade. She was 40 at that time. I was 23. She was the master at what she did. She often said that she'd been told that only the best teachers could teach first grade because it was the pivotal year in education where all the foundation was laid, where kids learned to read. And thinking about our time together, I realized that I spent 20 years with her in a way that no one else did. I saw her in a professional capacity daily. We usually spent mornings teaching our own 30 students, and then we opened up those big walls and combined our classes into a group of 60 kids for themed lessons in science, social studies, health, seasonal activities, art, and music. It was so much fun. We alternated teaching a lesson, each trying to outdo each other. Of course, music was solely Ruth's area of expertise. She could teach kids anything to music. It was magical. And thinking about funny stories, I, I had a lot of these I regaled my husband with, but I'll just share one. This one was one of my favorites. I often laughed to myself when I remembered the Heineken story. One day after school, she came over to me and she said, I had the Heineken today. And I looked really confused. I said, beer? She looked at me confused too. No, she said, Morgan was choking on a Jolly Rancher, and I had to Heineken him. <laughs> I said, oh my gosh, how scary. Is he okay? And she said, sure, he's fine. I said, Ruth, in the future, it's called the Heimlich. Heineken's a beer. And then the, we laughed. 
After I moved to Napa in 1998, Ruth and I continued our friendship. We spoke regularly on the phone for one and a half, two hour conversations. We did this for over 20 years. We discussed our kids, our grandkids, our spouses, our health, our lives. We had long, detailed conversations that I'll always cherish. Ruth accomplished so many things in her life. She taught over a thousand people how to read, how to spell, how to write, how to do math, and how to love learning. She spoke to her students in her sweet voice, and she'd bend down and say, oh, you little honey. Now, what child doesn't want to just do everything a teacher wants when they look at you like that and call you, you little honey? And she was just loved by those beautiful children. She taught me how to be a better teacher, and I value and the value of a long and loving friendship, and I thank her very much for that.